Welcome back to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Fraser. Joining us for the second half of our show is Sharon Richardson, founder and CEO of Just Soul Catering and president of Reentry Rocks. Sharon, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me, Bill. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Sharon, I ask you on because some weeks ago we spoke with Catherine Hoke from Defy Ventures, which is an entrepreneurship program for people with, with criminal histories. When I asked her to recommend a few graduates who might want to come on the show and tell their stories, you were on the top of her mind. You now run a successful catering business. But before we get into that story, take us back. Take us back to your childhood and the path that ultimately led to 20 years in prison. Bill, you know, when I think about my childhood, I think about me being born to two wonderful Caribbean parents and being raised basically by my grandmother, who was the one who was actually home all the time because both my parents worked. And mm -hmm. I grew up in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. And, you know, that area uh, over 56 years ago wasn't the best area to be brought up in, right. but it was where I was born into. So when I think about the neighborhood now, you know, reflecting back, things could have been different. I could have grown up in a better area, you know, with a white picket fence and <laughs> just having all the great education and exposure to different people who were actually going somewhere. Right. Unfortunately for me, I grew up in an area where a lot of drugs went on, a lot of guns and violence went on, a lot of robbery, a lot of families that were single homes. And so I was surrounded by many people who of course, I spent a lot of time in the streets, and both my parents worked, and my grandmother was basically the one who sat in the window, reading her Bible, looking out the window, making sure I didn't go any further than the stoop. Right. And so, you know, as you grow older, you fall under peer pressure, and your friends get you to come down the street and around the corner and down the block, and you start engaging in things like drinking beer and smoking weed and you find out that those things are more exciting than just sitting on the stoop, you know, <laughs> waiting for your mom to come home from work. And so I didn't realize, though, that this plays a huge part in who you become as an adult. I'm not sitting around as a child thinking to myself, wow, you know, don't do these things because it's going to turn you into this person that you may not later on like. I'm just going with the flow. Right. And so, you know, I'm being raised by a, a great mom who has an alcoholism problem. So we live inside of a house, and we're friends and neighbors with all the people on the block, but people really don't know what's going on or how this person is actually being raised. I wasn't really raised, meaning that I didn't have the fundamental things that would have directed me in a different path. So Sharon, if you don't mind me asking, what is it that led you to be attracted to abusive men? Right. Okay. So what led me to be attracted to abusive men it's still something that I am dealing with still to this day. And this is long after incarceration and long after therapy and long after much healing that I have actually done throughout my last maybe 26 years. I have been told in therapy that a lot of the reasons why I chose to be with the type of men that I was with came from my household, meaning that I became a caretaker. Mm -hmm. I became a fixer. I became that child that loved her mother so much that all she wanted to do was take care of her in the midst of her drinking, with her coming home from work and being mm -hmm. found on the floor. I thought that I could fix my mother's problems. I was really, really good at keeping secrets. I was really, really great at hiding the fact that my mom had a problem. Why? Because I wanted me to be accepted by all my friends and people in the neighborhood, I didn't want them to see that something was wrong, you know, terribly wrong in my family. And where I got that type of thinking, I'm still trying to figure that out, right? Because, you know, my grandmother had me in church every Sunday. She had this wonderful woman that would pick me up in those big, wonderful cabs that had the seats in the back. Her name was Miss Belgrave. I still remember her to this day, you know, and I spent all day Sunday in church, in choir, I became a brownie, a Girl Scout. I was brought out in a cotillion as a debutante. I had to keep this image up. I couldn't let people know that there was a lot of sad things going on inside my household. And so into my relationships as I became a grown adult woman, I believed that I carried these things. 
into my relationships, and I also look for people unconsciously that had problems. Mm. Why? Because Sharon needed to be able to fix these things. Sharon needed to be able to say that she was the one that was helping someone. Sharon needed to be the one to say that she was perfect, you know, in the eyes of people, and that the person that she was with, although she loved and cared for them, like I did my mom, had all of these problems, and I could fix it all. So, Sharon, you had a successful career as a corrections officer at Rikers Island when you met the man who changed your life, not for the better. Tell us about that. So, I worked as a correction officer from basically 1983 until the time of my arrest, which was May of 1990. And when I think about my years as working as a correction officer, I mean, that was the perfect job for someone like me, right? Again, I'm talking about this person who's a fixer, this person who can take care of everything. Lots of empathy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I can, you know, definitely relate to someone who has, you know, their life has gone wrong and they're behind bars trying to fight their case in court. Now, again, these are not conscious thoughts in my head. This is just the way life was for me moving forward. So I was always a person who was on time. I went to work. I was neatly pressed. My hair was done. I was young. I was just becoming a person with a career Mm -hmm. as a correction officer. My attempt to move forward was to take the captain's test and pass it one day and maybe even the depth test and pass that and become a depth one day and make better money and have a great household and raise my two children. Unfortunately, that's not what happened because when you have a job over here and then you have your personal life over here that's just reckless, eventually you're going to run into what my grandmother used to say, you know, you reap what you sow, Mm. right? And so this guy that I met in prison seemed to be someone that I was attracted to, that I was accustomed to being with, who wasn't in prison. So most of the guys that I kind of dated before this guy that I met in prison, you know, was like the bad boys out there making it happen, making the money, selling stuff for drugs, alcohol, you know, just the fast life, spending time in the clubs or whatever. Mm -hmm. So this guy seemed to be all about that. Now, I was married at the time. I was married to my son's father at the time, and we were having problems because I had just had my son maybe about eight to nine months, and I had gained a lot of weight, and so there were some issues surrounding intimacy and weight loss and just just things like that that kind of like really turned me on. And so going to work now, I knew about things that are unbecoming of a correction officer. And I also knew that it was against the rules to fraternize with someone that was incarcerated. But there was something about this guy. There was something that attracted me to him. Fatal attraction. Yes. I engaged myself in conversation with this young man, and he basically persuaded me to meet his family. And I went and I met his aunt and his uncle and a cousin of his. And then we became really good friends. And her and myself, we went and we got a tattoo together. And before you knew it, you know, it was more about, well, why don't we get Jeff out of jail? Why don't we bail him out of jail? And I'm like, wow, you know, okay, so something could be really, really wrong and dangerous about this, but maybe I could do it and get away with it. Who would know? And I'm feeling some kind of way about this guy. I'm feeling all this attraction. And, you know, every day that I'm going to work, it's not that I'm bringing him things or bringing him drugs. I'm not doing any of those things. It's not like that I was involved with any sexual intimacy. But you got him out of prison. But I got him out of prison and his family helped me. And I brought him home to my house. And at that time, my son's father and myself had separated. And so to me, this seemed like a perfect opportunity. But things went bad pretty quickly. Pretty quickly, four months. Wow. And what happened? During these four months, Jeff, uh, that was my abuser's name, he had basically exposed me to a lot of what he was doing in his life as far as selling drugs and the people that he, he hung around with. One of these gentlemen, we actually allowed him to come and live with us because he was in from another state and he didn't have any place to stay. So again, here I go. Taking in another bird with a broken wing. Exactly. And so I take him into my home. And during this time, Jeffries actually has already begun to abuse me. This was long before this guy even moved in. And so he was putting his hands on me and punching me and sexually abusing me and uh, abusing my children. Um, And I didn't find this out until after I was incarcerated that my daughter had actually been molested by this guy. Mm. And things were really, really going bad fast. So, you know, my case surrounded a huge piece that really had nothing to do with my incarceration, which was that I supposedly had opened up a life insurance policy. 
and plan to actually have this guy released, bring him home, have him killed and collect this money. Well, none of that was true. None of that was true. But the young man you brought into your home did kill him. It was a period of four months. This guy who was living was basically took me on as his older sister. He really adored my children, and he was actually tired of seeing the abuse. And we had a conversation that was just a regular conversation that the authorities actually took as the conversation that led to Jeffrey Bridges' death, which is, is that I actually hired this guy to have my abuser kill, and that is not the way it actually went down. When you were charged, this killer gave testimony against you in a plea bargain in order for him to get a reduced sentence. Absolutely. He also uh, recanted his statement at some point and then later on came back and actually told somewhat of the truth of what did go down. And at that time, the courts actually threw my case out again. And then I had to uh, look forward to applying for clemency, which didn't actually work for me. And then I ended up completing my full 20 years. So, Sharon, after you were released from prison after serving for 20 years, what was your plan to put your life back together? So when I think about my plans after this wonderful decision that was given to me that I was going to be released in May of 2010, I had to really, really absorb that at first because two decades of my life had been taken. I lost a lot. My mom died while I was in prison. My children grew up. And here I was getting ready to be released from the prison system that had me for 20 years. And so With all the dreams that I could possibly tell you that I had about what it would look like when I got out, I have to tell you that this sense of fear overcame me. And and when it did, it kind of collapsed everything inside of me that looked like, wow, this is really, really, really happening. But you got yourself an education in prison. You were a model prisoner. There was no talk of recidivism. You were ready to go. Yes, yes. I received my associate's degree and my bachelor's degree. I lived on the honor floor. I worked for the superintendent of the uh, prison. I also worked as a child care worker. I was, was part of the puppy program for 13 years. So I had all of these great accomplishments. You know, I had gotten four mm. units of clinical pastoral education. There was much under my belt that I could have used moving forward. I was no threat to society, and I was considered a model inmate, yes. But who's going to hire a former convicted felon? So I did not know that one of the huge barriers uh, for a formerly incarcerated individual was employment. I did not know that another huge barrier was housing. So when I came home, I said to myself, okay, what am I going to do? But fortunately, there was this wonderful woman, her name was Sister Mary Nerney, who worked at an agency called Steps to End Family Violence, where I actually still work. That's my daytime job. She was the founder of a nonprofit organization. Now, nonprofit organizations are formerly incarcerated friendly. They do Mm -hmm. hire formerly incarcerated individuals, which is great. So for me, I was able to get this interview and create this position as a reentry specialist And I had been working with formerly incarcerated individuals from the time that I actually came home until actually now. I also work for my church when I came out, which is the House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn, where uh, Pastor Reverend Daughtry is the senior pastor. And he actually also hired me when I first came out because he was highly involved with my family and he was very supportive of myself and my release. And so he didn't see any threat with me running a program for him. So I did that for the first, like, maybe four months and then started working for Steps to End Family Violence. How did you get involved with the Five Ventures, and and how did they help you start your own business? Oh, wow. So getting involved with the Five Ventures was huge. I had participated with some people who were doing the Vagina Monologues. And in doing the Vagina Monologues, which is a huge production that Eve Ensler uh, wrote a play about, with women who have actually been exposed to violence in every angle that you could possibly think of. Mm -hmm. Me, as a formerly incarcerated individual, playing a part in this play was huge. And so I was speaking to one of the uh, producers and just telling them some of my dreams. And they were like, wow, you should get involved with The Five Inches. And I'm like, what's that? They were like, this wonderful agency, this nonprofit agency that helps formerly incarcerated individuals become entrepreneurs. I was like, wow. So I got in contact with them. They called me in for an interview, and I got accepted. So when they asked me, well, Sharon, you know, what's your business? I had to stop again, Bill, and think. And I'm like, business? And then I said, Sharon, what is your business? 
And so I thought about something that I love a lot, and that's food. Mm -hmm. And I thought about something else. I love people. So when you put people and food together, that's how Just So (laughs) Catering became, you know, and evolved. So I'm the founder and CEO of my uh, startup small catering business called Just So Catering. I've been to the website. The food looks really yummy. Tell us a little bit more about it. (laughs) Yeah, so we cook soul food. We cook things like macaroni and cheese, collard greens, banana pudding. (laughs) Uh, We do vegan dishes. We do vegetarian dishes. We do brunch meals. We do whatever it is that the customer loves. And part of of our business, what actually makes us different than other catering businesses, is that we do a period of storytelling. So we tell the client that upon booking, that you could actually book us to tell a story. And part of that story is is telling people how Just So came to be. Hmm. Tell them about the five ventures, tell them about formerly incarcerated individuals, you know, who have stories from inside and how they have come home and made a difference in their life. We're giving back life to people who hire us because if we can do it, that means that they can do it, you know? And so that's a huge element in Just So Catering. And we're hiring formerly incarcerated individuals to work with us. And with hope, we're actually bringing together Reentry Rocks and Just So so that we can start a culinary program. Did you have any training as a chef or is this just recipes from your mom and grandma? This is just recipes from my grandma and my mom, you know, right out of a raw kitchen. (laughs) No real training. I'm just a very visual person. I watch people. I love to learn. And because I love food, I love, you know, just learning more and more dishes. You know, I have my food handler certificate now, and I'm trying to get my vendor's license so that we could do a food truck. Yeah, this is huge, Bill, and I'm really, really excited about it. A food truck would be a lot of work. Oh, man, I know that. And so I have this wonderful mentor. She's great. Her name is April. She works at Morgan Stanley. She is definitely someone who's standing by my side, and she will help me with creating this, you know. And then I have a wonderful partner in my life who's also supportive. And then I have my children. So I have a lot of people that have my back. I have my job, my daytime job, you know, all of my coworkers. These are people who are going to help me make this happen. So it's a wonderful dream, but it's going to be a reality really soon. You know, you came out of prison into what sounds like a a pretty healthy community looking to support you. What happened to former felons who were given their $20 to close on their back and put out the door? How do they reenter? So many of the clients that I work with, they only have the money and the clothes on their backs when they come home. They don't even have a family or a place they can call home or a pillar to lay their head down on. They can't get a job. They become very discouraged. And not all, but some just go back to what they know. Sure. Thank God for a lot of the reentry programs. You know, I got my 501c3, and so I'm trying to create Reentry Rocks, which is a nonprofit organization that works with women coming home who have domestic violence cases and issues surrounding violence in their life. And so with this program, we would be another program to many of the other reentry programs that's out there that support men and women that are coming home who are not fortunate enough to have money or to have family or supporters that are in their corner. Why? Because we're trying to shut the prison system down and find other means, um, alternative to incarceration. You know, this whole thing on mass incarceration is just over the top to just send people to prison and then expect them to come home after 25 years and start all over again when you have a lot of jobs that won't even hire, when you have a lot of apartment buildings and and houses, private homes where people don't even want you renting there. So you can't have it both ways. There has to be a forgiving system and a forgiving culture. It's very, very important. And so our voices are out there. So I do a lot of speaking engagements And I go around and I tell my story so that people can hear and and empathize with what it means for someone to spend that kind of time in prison and come home and have nothing. Sharon, because of your own life course, you tend to focus a lot on abused women. I was really surprised when doing some reading, getting ready to talk to you, that two-thirds of women in prison for killing someone close to them were abused by that person. Doesn't the law take that into account? Well, when you talk about the law, you know, I work with the uh, Corrections Association, and right now we have a bill that we're trying to get passed that will almost be like a forgiveness bill, a bill that will release women that are in prison who've been convicted of killing their abusers and also set the law differently so that the judge would have a discretion over sentencing Mm -hmm. when it comes to those type of crimes. And so we're hoping 
that as time passes that bills like this can actually be implemented into the uh, criminal justice system so that people don't have to go to prison or if they do, they don't have to spend the amount of time that I spent in prison for a crime like this. And this is not a get out of jail free card. This is not a bill that passes that says it's okay for women to kill. This is a bill that shows the understanding of domestic violence and all that it involves. We talk about violence in the lives of women. And I think about the percentage of women that I spent time with while I was at Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. There were many women that were incarcerated that had been exposed to domestic violence and sexual violence in their life that didn't even have a case that was related to to domestic violence. Now, what happens with them? So, yeah, they may be in prison for, say, robbery or maybe having, you know, a bad drug case or something like that. Yet in their background and in their past and in their younger years or whatever, they've been exposed to things that they don't even want to talk about. And so we become stuffers. And that's what a lot of this culture, as far as the prison system, you know, is involving. And then you also have the aging men and women that are in prison that have been in prison for so long mm-hmm. to what they're going to do when they get out. And they're going to the parole board and they're being hit with two years and hit with two years and hit with two years and can't get out. So what makes me a model prisoner inside and not a model citizen to be able to be released? I can sit at that parole board and you can tell me how great I am and all the wonderful accomplishments that I've done in prison and a great education that I received. But then you tell me I have to spend two more years in prison. And then I go to the parole board after those two years and you tell me I have to spend another two years in prison. Mm. You know, and so now I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70 years old. And when you do decide to let me out, what can I possibly do? How can I possibly give back to society? And this is what's going on. So, Sharon, looking toward the future, what advice do you have for young people growing up in neighborhoods that might be broken, where they don't have role models, where there's a lot of crime on the streets, where they're exposed to this kind of violence in their community? How can they grow up and not get themselves on the wrong path? Right. So I don't think, Bill, that the weight of that belongs so much on that community. I think that the weight lays more on the advocates that the advocates that are out there and people like myself, that we don't just come together meeting after meeting and just talk about the problem and talk about the solution, but we're not part of the solution. We have to figure out a way to get into those communities, get into those neighborhoods and be able to express what needs to be actually done and let people know that they have a safe haven where they can come to and say, listen, This is what's going on in my life, and I need help. Like right now, I'm part of the Nova Foundation. The Nova Foundation recently bought Bayview Correctional Facility, and their purpose is to turn that into the Women's Building of New York City. And I am so grateful to be a part of what they are creating. They're doing a documentary that will at some point be released to show all of the women that have come home that were part of Bayview Correctional Facility, and that's over by Chelsea Pier to be able to express the needs of women in New York City and how young people could come to this building and hear the stories and get help. This is what needs to be done. More of this needs to be done to save our world today. Sharon, you're quite an inspiration. Thanks so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. Anytime, Bill. Anytime. (laughs) That was Sharon Richardson, founder and CEO of Just Soul Catering and president of Reentry Rocks, Here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute, I'm your host, Bill Frezza. You can check out Real Clear Radio Hour on Facebook or follow us on Twitter at Real Clear Frezza. And while you're at it, take a look at realclearfuture.com for daily updates on the next big wave of technologies. We'd like to thank our sponsor, Old Boston Restorations, for their support. Old Boston is a boutique property management company in Boston South End. Visit them online at oldbostonrestorations.com. That wraps up our show for this week. Please join us next week, same time, same station. See you then. 